I'm delighted to share some perspectives for those of you entering graduate school generally and specifically thinking about education. Now, I could simply end my time here by saying that if you don't go directly into graduate school or you never go to graduate school, it's not the end of the world. You were educated at Loyola. You know and share the value of lifelong learning and you will grow personally and professionally. That said, let me tell you a little bit about my story. Well, to be honest, I went to graduate school to become a baseball coach. In undergrad, I majored in American history, played baseball, but not for the school team, but took a series of classes in coaching, kind of like a minor or mini minor. So as I was thinking about what to do at the end of my undergrad, the state of New York was phasing in a new rule. You had to be, get a master's to be a certified teacher. Well, I wanted to be a baseball coach, so I had to become a baseball coach who taught social studies for most of the day. Well, I never did become a social studies teacher or a baseball coach. Not long after I entered the graduate program, I met my advisor. He was an influential person in my life and convinced me after many, many debates to give up my dream of being a baseball coach and apply for a PhD program. And most importantly, introduced me to my wife and my life partner. After many, many years in graduate school, I earned a master's and a PhD in educational psychology and methodology. To this day, I'm not sure I made the right decision. I mean about getting the PhD. I definitely made the right decision about marrying the most wonderful, beautiful, talented, smartest person I know. In this segment, I'm going to share with you what I learned about the power of effective advising. I'm going to talk to you about a couple different paths for entering graduate degrees in education in some of the subfields. And I might leave you with a few questions to ponder as you make this very important choice. Networking and advising. The key to any successful venture, whether it's in your job, while you're an undergraduate student, or a graduate student, is to build a network of people who you trust. This group should definitely include one of your loyal faculty members, or maybe two. Somebody who works in the industry, maybe an alumni, or someone who works in the field that you want to work in. And then someone in your friend group who is least likely, and let me say that again, least likely to follow the norms and traditions of your pathways. I have learned that most of the people in my network who kind of follow that, those who I learned the most from. You can get a whole master class in that. Each of these people should be a good coach. They push you. They're honest with you. They show vulnerability that helps you see the humanity required in making a difference, not only in yourself, but in the field and in the world. All right, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. Don't tell anybody. Most students and advisors don't understand or fully appreciate the value of effective advising because there isn't really a shared understanding or definition of what it is and what it's not. When students think about their advising experiences, what do they think of? Well, mostly selection of courses, meeting graduate requirements, and stuff I got to do. Given that preconceived notions, many of the conversations in formal advising tends to land on those things. Let's say 80-20, like a good burger at Clark Burger or Alonzo's. 80% of the time you're talking with your advisor about courses and registration. Should I take this? Should I take this? How about this? Maybe I can take that. Rather, a good advising relationship in undergrad and grad should be a series of sustained conversations about the field of study, discussion of articles maybe that you found and want to share with your advisor rather than he sharing with you or she sharing with you. Other more micro topics. So where's the field heading? What are the counter narratives? Pushing new ways of thinking about the field. Who's writing about that? Who's on the cutting edge? In education, these questions can include, why do we have grades? And what's the deal with SAT scores? How come education hasn't moved hardly at all in 100 years? In essence, you're looking for people who are thinking outside of the box. Now that's cliche, but I don't know about you. I'm a little tired of the box. And in the coming years, you could be part of a team of scholars who designs and creates new boxes that are more just and inclusive, particularly in the field of education. Now let me say this. I firmly believe that you are in charge of your education, not the grad requirements, not the professors, not even your advisor. I encourage you to bring difficult questions to your network. Ask, why does it work that way? Why have we always done that way, even if it gets them frustrated? And be ready to engage in honest and sometimes heated intellectual debate. But be sure you're listening too willing to explore their viewpoints that are backed up by evidence and doing the extensive reading and reflection to approve on your understanding of the complexity of the field. Graduate degrees in education. Are you interested in becoming a teacher? For those of you who are still with me, let me share some patterns that I have learned from advising students who are interested in graduate work and education. First, there are most people who are interested in becoming a classroom teacher but who did not major in education while they're an undergrad. There are about three options here. There are probably more, but at least three I want to share with you. One is a master's in arts of teaching that's offered at an accredited university. The MAT program is a blend of theory, pedagogy, and field experience. 
This provides solid preparation is one of the more common ways or pathways to enter education, usually in the Northeast, also in Virginia, where a master is required to get permanent certification to teach. Another way is through what we call an alternative pathway program, such as Teach for America or Urban Teachers. You may have heard of those. These programs provide immediate access to be the instructor or the teacher of record, but you earn the masters as you go along. But finally, there is a shortage of teachers across the country, and many teachers are entering on an emergency license or a conditional license. And that will also provide you a little time so you can enter a master's program and you're able to get that master's as you teach. Now there are pluses and minuses to each pathway, but I must stress that being a teacher without a strong background in education is very difficult. And lots of people even drop out of the field after less than five years. I know that's harsh and it looks rough out there, but I'll tell you, teaching is a very rewarding profession solid starting salary, and good teachers make a positive difference in the lives of hundreds of children and their families. So for my money, I encourage you to consider an MAT program that is commitment to social justice. You know, I happen to know one that's uh, not far from where I'm standing right here, if you're interested. Other education fields. You know, there's another group of students I've talked to over the years who are interested in pursuing a graduate degree, but they completed an undergrad in either education or psych, or communications, or many other degrees. But they want to pursue a master's in another field, such as school counseling, or a PhD, or a master's in a subfield. That subfield could be educational technology, curriculum instruction, literacy, research, statistics, higher education, higher education in student affairs, education policy, sociology of education. There's a lot to choose from there. And it would take hours to describe the similarities and differences in these sub-disciplines. But if you're interested, please you know, look at the websites on a variety of campuses or other members of the School of Education. And I'd be happy to speak with you about that as well. Now, many of these students don't go right into grad school. They work for a few years, either as a teacher or one of the other what I'd call helping-related professions. And if you're interested in a master's or PhD program, you're, it's very important that you get to know several of your professors and kind of ask them, what got them into research? What kind of research are they conducting? Could you do an independent study with that professor or volunteer to conduct a literature review on a topic of joint interest? Identifying, summarizing, summarizing and crafting a literature review is a skill that needs to be acquired in graduate school. There's a ton of writing in education graduate courses, and no matter how good you think you are in writing, you will always need to improve markedly. Successful graduate students, in my experience, and faculty, have a consistent and rigid write, reading and writing schedules. Many of my colleagues found that scheduling writing blocks of time and reading time is critical to maintain a pipeline of grant proposals, journal articles, and conference presentations. You have to have a love of reading, be curious, and get ready to fail a lot to be successful in the field of education. And here's a few final questions for you to consider. What's the hurry? You've been in school for a long, long time. Maybe you need some time away from formal education. Find a job or do a year-long service project. For many people entering teaching, they usually wait two or three years before they start a master's degree program. Can you make money doing that? Going to graduate school? Sure. There are assistantships available to support your education. PhD programs prov provide tuition and stipends if you secure a position with a faculty member or other educational position on campus. And finally, for me, can I still be a baseball coach? The answer is yes. You can always become a baseball coach or maybe even play center field. Put me in, coach. I'm ready to play today.